Much bigger. Yeah. So now we need to go here. We're going to ignore the video. And is this text big enough? Make that, make that much bigger. Even bigger. That's How's that? Yeah, just remember, people are looking at this on small laptops. Yeah, so I'm going to basically just, ah, uh, that's not the one. Uh, other window is this guy. There we go. OK. So here we go. I'm basically just going to be pasting this stuff in. Uh, so I will skip a lot of the infer, intro stuff here. Uh, for these tests, you will need to make a couple of directories in PNVS Dune Scratch users. You will need to do that either with an IFDH or if you're logged into a GPVM, you can just do straight make dir. If you are not, you will need to do IFDH make dir instead of here. Okay, so we've done that. And now we're going to submit this first uh, job command here which I will do with you. Actually, no, I won't because I didn't set up the software yet. Um... Yeah, actually, uh, can you make that even bigger? I'm having a, I think you may have lost. Can you make that even bigger? I, I can't read it on my screen. And of course, I don't know if anybody else can. Like that. Yeah, even better, but even bigger. Even bigger. Okay, thanks. Okay, I don't know how big it goes, but we'll find out. Okay. So now we're going to submit this. And again, I'm just cutting and pasting what is in the tutorial there. So if everything goes well, you should get an output, basically what's on the screen there. It will, of course, have a, a different date on it. Um, see, now we have 2023. I didn't update the, the page. This is still from last May. But again, it, it's the same. OK. so. Basically, we're just submitting. Um, we don't have too much time to go through these, but um, some of the key options, and there are more, but the ones you're going to want to know in detail are, are these. So the minus N option will control if you're doing a, a large submission or you're doing money crawl or you're going to have many, many jobs. Um, you would control that with the minus N switch. It defaults to one, of course. Uh, and then you'll get the process ID and then that number is what comes after the period and before the at. So it goes from zero to n minus one. Um, the memory, disk, CPU, and lifetime. This is basically your resource request. How much memory do you want? How much disk do you need? How much CPU, which again, of course, defaults to one. And the uh, maximum amount of time you expect your job to run. So the defaults there are 2,010 gigabytes, one and eight hours. You can get, I think, up to uh, close to 96 hours uh, if you should you need it. Almost all jobs tend to run within eight hours. Uh, and you can ask, again, for more memory or more disk if you need it. Note, however, uh, what is charged against the permanent quota is what you request, not what you actually use because the scheduler will block the amount of memory that you request. So don't request 10 gigs of memory in a job, right, when you only need one, figuring, oh, well, that way, if I have some small tail of jobs that needs more memory, I never have to worry about it. Don't do that, because that's going to block other people from running in that memory, and it's just going to sit there idle. So again, request what you need. Um, the, the slot waiting, basically what the quota is charged <laughs> The, the greater of the number of CPUs or memory divided by 2,000 megabytes. So for example, right, if you request three gigs of memory, you are charged 1.5 slots, 4,000, you're charged two, or whatever the fraction uh, there is. Um, the offsite stuff does not count against the quota, so it doesn't affect that. But again, um, what you really want to do is aim for memory and runtime requirements that will cover basically 90 to 95% of your jobs on the first pass. The remainder, rather than set you know, arbitrarily huge resource limits to deal with the small tail, there is a feature called auto-release. There's a documentation linked here uh, that will say, if my job goes held because I exceed my resource request in runtime or memory, restart the job automatically with a higher request and you can tell it how much more to add. 
So that way that small tail can use the, the higher limit, but most of the stuff that doesn't need the higher limit can use the smaller. The advantage is your jobs okay. will start sooner and you will use fewer resources. So everybody wins. Yep. We have a question in the audience. Oh, hi, thank you. Uh, actually, two um, quick questions, General. Uh, for the submit command, is, it, it's quite long with a lot of arguments. Is there a uh, like a batch submit where where this can be put in a, a script file or, or something? Uh, is, is you know uh, with directives you know on each line? Um, I've seen that in other systems. That's one question. And the other question is, uh, am I limited in terms of the number of jobs, or you know, uh, as a as a user, the you know how many resources I, I can use? Uh, you know, is there a yearly quota or anything? And and how would I check that if there is? I'll just comment that there's sort of the um, if you are doing stuff just for yourself, there actually aren't limits. But if we find somebody abusing the system, like for example. Uh, we won't name names, but we found somebody who had run 5,000 60 hour jobs that all timed out on 60 hours. And I'm going to actually, my plenary tomorrow, mm -hmm. I'm going to point out that that costs a, a, in cash and carbon CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. That is a serious mistake to make. Mm -hmm. So the answer is we don't actually stop people because sometimes people have a lot to do. But it's very, very important that you test and not submit a really big thing until you know that you're doing what you want to do. Because there's a huge, the, the main way that, soft, that, that CPU is wasted is people rerunning the same large job five times and then discovering they screwed up three days later. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, okay, so the... Uh, First question, uh, you can absolutely put these submit commands in a script, that's, that's fine. It's not quite like Slurm though, if you're used to that. But yeah, you could have a, a bash script that does job sub submit, whatever, job sub submit, whatever, um, sure. Uh, individual submissions, the minus N is capped at 10,000. So if you need more than that, you'll have to do multiple submissions. And that is due to scaling issues. Um, the other weird thing is this resource provides usage model. You'll see later that's actually going to go away. But the three options are dedicated, opportunistic, and offsite. You can join them in a comma separated list. So dedicated is the Dune Fermi grid quota. Opportunistic is still Fermi grid, but if other experiments are under their quota, you can use more, you can go beyond the Dune quota opportunistically. So you should always do that. Always, There's always, no always. In dedicated and opportunistic anymore. They've been treated the same for the last five years. Yeah, so basically you should never run without that. And really you should almost never run without offsite because there are thousands of cores out there. Um, the, the total size of CPUs available at sites other than Fermilab is much larger than <coughs> Dune Fermi Good Quota by a factor of probably four to five. So you're just hurting yourself by not using offsite resources. The default is to use all of them. And because of the fact that all of our jobs are running in containers now, there is absolutely no difference whatsoever between the Fermilab worker node environment and an offsite worker node environment. It is exactly the same. The only difference you might see depending on what you're doing is just network latency, depending on where you're pulling the data from. Uh, and we discussed that earlier. But Ken, yeah, can so you really also do a just control plus everything. on the screen. Oh, uh, on this guy? The, I, yeah. 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 Uh, you can also pass in arbitrary um, HD Condor scale class as the main one people often use is to tell it what singularity image to use. Um, again, that's just the container, um, which is now called apptainer. So if you see the word apptainer, that's really just singularity. Um, same thing. Uh, this is the default one with. Current job sub, you have to do a little bit of weird escaping of the quotes up here. Um, that is also going to go away in the future, but for now you have to do that. Um, then there are other things you can do as far as you want to make sure that the required CVMFS repositories are actually working on the worker node. That is almost always true, but once in a while you will get one that, that doesn't. So that's all this target has CVMFS long string here that's that's all that's doing is making sure that when you get on the worker node 
CVMFS is actually going to work because if it doesn't, probably yeah. nothing else is going to. Oh. Uh, you can also is ancient. Hmm? The revision 105 is. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like 2000 something now. I should change it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I meant to do that. I think I forgot. So yeah. uh, you can also pass uh, environment variables into the job. So this is a minus e switch here. So that will set the environment environment variable var to be the value val. You can do as many times as you want. New this time, you will see these two gfal environment variables I'm passing in here. At the moment, uh, that is necessary to prevent problems. Uh, well, it's really only, I think, on one site and will probably be fixed with the next IFDH update. But um, this is fine to do in general for all jobs because, since again, since you're running in Singularity, um, that location will always be there. Okay, so going on, so we did that. Uh, you submitted your job. It ran hopefully by now. So I can do, for example, job sub do what experiment is this Dune, which I can't spell. Fortunately, you don't have to be able to do that to be on Dune, otherwise I'd be in big trouble. So what Dune jobs have I got running? Oh, it's actually still running, Ooh, but it should finish nice. any minute. So what will happen is you will it's going to copy this fi uh, small file to your scratch directory, the one that we made at the, at the beginning. So if you look, so I had done, I actually, believe it or not, did test this stuff. So this actually will work. I did test it last night. Um, oh, sorry. I need... So yeah, so you get the small file. As you can see, this is one I ran um, before I went to bed last night. So it does work. To find you will eventually get a, a file in there and you can look at that, but you're going to use extra D to look at that, right? Yes, because we talked about that earlier too, or I didn't, well, Mike and company did. You're going to open root files with extra D pretty much all the time. Okay, as far as job manipulation goes, if I wanted to remove, let's say I want to remove that job, it's still running, so I would do job sub RM. Um, you don't, if you set the job subgroup environment variable, you don't have to type minus G dune all the time. So then I'm going to take this string. I need the whole string, not just the number, because the numbers are not necessarily unique across the, uh, across the different job sub servers. Okay, so that job's gone now. So if I did job sub Q again, oh, it's gone. Okay, so then you can also hold them. You can release them if they go over resource request. Um, if you need to remove an entire submission, you just leave off the dot number. That will remove all jobs in that submission. If you want to remove all your jobs, you do this. You can also be fancier and add any arbitrary HD condor style constraint you want. So I only want to remove, you know, for example, jobs that are held and requested more than eight gigabytes of memory and went held because they went over memory. And, okay, you can get all as fancy as you want in there. But um, for interest of time, let's skip to the next part. Talk about submitting with custom code tarballs. Uh, first point I want to make is you may well not need to make a custom tarball depending on what you're doing. For example, suppose we were looking at the stuff um, that Tom did earlier. Suppose I only wanted to change one line in one of the base fickle files in the release. I want to change some param config parameter from 10 to 50 or to make something up. It is actually much more efficient if you just make a local copy in your job of the fickle file from CVMFS, change the one line in question, and just run everything else in the release, right? You don't have to download Proto Dune Anna or Dune software, build all that tar it up and ship that out to the jobs. So keep that in mind that depending on what you're doing, unless it's really something uh, where you had to recompile, you probably actually don't need a tar file. But okay, let's assume you did. Um, there are good ways to get tar files into your jobs and there are other ways. I am only going to talk about the good way. So here, if you want to do this yourself, um, you can just copy my um, existing setup. I did not coordinate with Tom this time. Normally we do, but so I'm actually a version or two behind in uh, doing software, but these instructions work equally well for you know any release. So what my, my run script is going to do 
uh, is actually source not quite the same setup script as you did earlier. I'm going to source a slightly different version of it. The slightly different version of it, if we do the diff down here, is, is the following. So really all I'm doing is changing from the hard-coded Dune app, wherever you did this when you built, right? Because remember, slash Dune whatever is not going to be available on worker nodes. What we do instead is we use this input tardir local environment variable. So who cares what the actual path is? It doesn't matter. You can just tell the script. That variable will be set for you if you submit your tarball with the good way. And you can just use that. It doesn't actually matter what the full path is and everything should work. Down here, I create the tar file. Um, just one thing to note here. All I'm including are the, the setup scripts, the work directories where the custom fickle lives. I did not include the source directory. I did not include the build directory in the tar file that get made when you're we were doing the MRB stuff earlier. You actually almost certainly do not need those. This helps keeps the tar file smaller, makes the transfer more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. There's no point in lugging around hundreds of megabytes of files you're never going to touch, right? And they also exclude the, the dot .git stuff. Again, stuff you're never going to actually touch in the job. Why copy around? New submission is here. It looks a little bit different. Um, that is really the, the key thing here is the tar file name. I use this Dropbox format you'll see here. This is using the good way, the rapid code distribution service. Basically what happens is the tar file gets published to a special CVMFS repository that uh, publishes on a much faster rate than the normal CVMFS. So that's what these Fife user CVMFS repositories are here. There are four of them to help spread the load. You don't a priori know which one you're gonna get. It doesn't matter, they're all identical, but we check that they're all work since we don't know um, which one we're gonna get. But you know, again, if one doesn't work, probably the others don't work either. So really the only thing that, that are different here, we have the tar file name, and then we have the slightly longer append local condor requirements. I'm still running the same. I'm gonna run a different script here, but again, everything else is basically the same. A um, little bit long, a little bit higher memory request as well. But again, you can you can adjust that um, as needed. All uh, right, um, let me skip this bit. Now for monitoring, uh, we have the FifeMon tool. You can see what your jobs are doing. You can see what Dune as a whole is doing. Uh, let me... Controls are right over my screen here. So here's what Dune is doing. Dune Pro is busy, not too much going on elsewhere. I have just one older job from before. You can then click on your username. That will show you just your jobs, shows you where they're running, how many are running, your efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. Record of recent submissions. You can choose the time range in question up here. I know I'm going very quickly through this, but uh, okay, coming back. The other useful thing sometimes is the infamous why are my jobs held page? Ooh, yeah. So You'll see these weird hold reason code. These are Condor codes. We have a little helpful translation chart up here. Um, so if you see hold reason code 26, that is you exceeded some resource request. Um, I think one is memory, two is disk, and eight is runtime. And you can see here, it prints out the hold reason. So for example, these were actually um, DES jobs I was submitting. But as you can see, I exceeded my runtime limit. Okay, now if you want to see, I need to update that link. You can either do job sub fetch log here on the command line to get your logs. You can also view them in Python. So uh, let's discard this page. So for example, let's look at some recent submission I had. I don't even know what this is, but it doesn't matter. Um, you click on the job. You can then go over, you hit view sandbox files. No, 
you might get asked to log in. Again, this is just your Fermi Lab Services password that you use for email, so nothing, nothing special there. Okay, so this is a test from I think this morning. So here's the the script you actually ran, the condor logs, and then the standard out and the standard error from the jobs will be the dot out and the dot error. So you don't have to download them; you can just view them in the browser. Blah 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 blah. blah. Lots of debugging stuff. What happened in the job? Well, ah, exit zero. Okay, I'm happy. Okay, so going back where we were then, just again, I'm trying to race through a bunch of this stuff as much as I can. Um, if you remember nothing else from this talk, it is this point in red. Anytime you are testing a new workflow, anytime you are taking an existing workflow and you change anything, you change one line in your script, you change one config parameter in the fickle, anything at all, retest, test with one job. When that works, go up to a handful, something like 10, right? Kind of scale roughly logarithmically. As Heidi mentioned before, the biggest problems we have are with that is people make their workflow, they submit the 10,000 maximum jobs. Oh my God, they all failed. Ah, oh, clearly there was a problem with the system. It must not have been anything I did. Let me submit 10,000 jobs again. I bet it will work better this time. And they all fail again and wash, rinse, repeat. Whereas if you had tested with one job, if there's a problem, it will probably show up. At least in, until you have, you know, there's sometimes there are problems with scaling and concurrent access and things. But again, just be careful about how many jobs are accessing, for example, the same input file. Um, be sure to pre stage your input data sets with Sam. Use the rapid code distribution service for getting your tarballs in. That's basically just the example we looked at with the Dropbox tar file name thing. There are, as I said, other ways to get files in. Um, be careful with that though. Also big thing on outputs, be very, very careful how many output files go into any single one directory in Dcache. There is a database behind Dcache. If you get more than kind of a few thousand files in any one directory that can cause severe slowdowns which will affect not only you, but lots of other people. So be very, very careful of that as well. Do not be doing in your jobs IFDH with wildcards. That can get, again, very slow and is computationally expensive on the server side. That, again, can affect other people and on other experiments. This is not a job thing, but I mentioned it here anyway. Never, ever, 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 ever ever under any circumstances run HAD directly on files in PNFS on the GPBM machines. For example, HAD, PNFS, whatever, never, ever, 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 ever do that. How many evers? <sighs> Not enough because it still happens. Because then the story guys are looking at my office and say, who's the yeah. crazy doing user that's doing this? Right. Do, and again, do you mean that by can affect via NSF, via NSF or via via X root D as well. Right. HAD will accept if you do, you know, root FNDCA, blah, 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 PNFS doing file one. That is fine. If you HAD okay. using the X root D URIs on the source files, no problem there. Yeah. But Half don't just do HAD. the bare PNFS, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Kafana HAD actually does the X root. So yeah, there is an auto conversion in there for you. But yeah. Okay. So that's kind of the whirlwind tour of, of that. Um, other things I've seen people do that you should not do um, are list, fi list, I'm sorry, file lists instead of using SAM data sets. That is very suboptimal because it doesn't necessarily check cache. And it also does not respect uh, tape order and things. And you may miss out on if your job is running at a remote site where there's a local copy of the file and your list is hard coded some other path, you're then potentially crossing the ocean and streaming. You don't have to. Um, other tools for job submission exist. Uh, they are not supported. You are completely on your own if you use them. Tickets will not. Huh? I meant, yes, this no, Tom's is, is, okay, I meant actually project.py. A few people still use that. <laughs> you are completely on your own in that case. 
no support whatsoever. Okay, that said, um, I have a little bit of time. I do want to at least mention that Job Sub Light is coming. So Job Sub Light is basically just an evolution of the existing Job Sub that consists of both a server and a client. So that when you get in the job ID, right, you have number at job sub 0123, right? So those are, they're actually servers on there. Job sub light gets rid of the server and you're actually talking directly to the H2 Condor schedulers. The way you interact with it is very, very, very similar to legacy job sub. It's, it's not quite a hundred percent mapping, but I bet it's 99%. You can already test it uh, on Dune GPVM 14 and 15. You do not actually have to run any special setups. It is all also available on all machines if you set it up uh, in CVMFS. Thing to note is that will be the default the next time we give this tutorial in May. So it behooves you to start getting used to it, at least test it out, see if there's any bugs people have missed. It now will be the default of February 15. Uh, we'll oh, sorry, will be the default, I should say, earlier. Legacy yes. job sub will work till, I think, April or something. Well, March 15 is the current date. So they they moved it back. Move. I think they moved it back two weeks. Well, again? Um, so, anyway, the time when we do this at the next club meeting, everything will be job sub late. The way you can get to it now, if you want to test it, instead of doing set up jobs of client, just do set up jobs of client v light. Um, you can run the same submission. This is almost the same, other than I had to change the mail flag. Um, the biggest change from legacy jobs of to jobs of light on the user side is it's going to use tokens instead of X509 proxies. So if you try to do this now, um, what's going to happen? Uh, well, it will happen once I do. Uh, I'm going to intentionally get rid of my key just so that I force this to happen. Um, so now I'm going to use stops of light. So you're probably going to get something like this. OK, it's going to spit this web URL and tell you, go cut and paste this to the browser. If you've ever taken you know, anti-spam or anti-phishing training, it will tell you never do this sort of thing. In this case, you actually should do it. So I go over to my browser, which doesn't have to be running on the Dune GPVM machine, actually. I'm going to cut and paste that link in there. It's just basically you have to approve that uh, CA login can access a token in your name. Always choose Fermilab here as the identity provider, even if you see your home institution. You hit log on. It may or may not ask you for your services password if you're already logged in or not. Okay, I've successfully approved the code. I go back to the window and there it goes. And it automatically then got myself a token and it submitted the job. So fairly painless. You do have to do this the first time you ever use jobs of late. And if you go 30 days without doing any job related activity or something that would get you a token, then you would be asked to do that again. So if you're scripting stuff in your submissions, uh, just be sure that you have the token already before you hit launch on the script because you'd have to otherwise intercept this. Um, easiest thing to do in that case is just submit some dummy job, like submit this example job at the top, right? Just submit it once, immediately kill it. And then thereafter, you're good for another 30 days. Okay, so then you get this, it goes on, job sub RM, fetch log, all that stuff works. One thing to note, you can't see or manipulate jobs submitted with job sub light with legacy job sub and vice versa. Other things to note uh, for now, uh, there's a few things which I think are nicer than they were, but um, just to be aware of a couple things. Uh, you will not get the emails when job subs or job sub light jobs finish yet. That's being worked on. Uh, things are not yet visible in Fifemon, but that is absolutely going to happen before everything goes to production. Um, the other weird gotcha at the moment is your output directory must be group writable. So not just writable by you. 
but writable by Dune. So you have to run Schmod on this subdirectory. Just, I think the individual directory you're using for testing is enough. You don't have to do the whole tree, I don't think. Um, that should be fixed during the next decache downtime is the plan, but just to be aware of it right now. Um, the other nice thing is multiple tar file name options are now supported. So if you we're pulling stuff in from two, uh, two tar balls, minus F behavior is a little different. See the documentation. Um, right now it does not work from LX plus. There are plans to figure out how to do submissions from offsite. That is something we, we do want to support, but for now that's not set up yet. Okay. That is the end of the job sub part. Okay. Unfortunately, we got two minutes. Rich, I will just try to introduce the highlights very quickly here. If I can get rid of this, there we go. Okay, so POMS is kind of how you would do workflows. Um, there are other uh, systems under development for kind of the large scale production stuff. But again, reiterate, if you're doing big, really big stuff, talk to the production people, They'll probably just do it for you. Uh, but anyway, um, we've got the main, Main page looks something like this. Um, I've got several examples of config files and, and demos here. These should all be working. I will note these are all with legacy job sub at the moment. Um, there are any, num any number of ways you can split up your input data sets. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to go over many of them in details. I would like to talk to the POMS people. I don't know when or where this would happen, but I get the impression that there's still quite a bit of a learning curve for people with POMS, and it might be useful to have some dedicated workshop that is just on POMS where we can go through this stuff a lot slower and get into more realistic cases. So we have examples where you do, uh, for example, like when we were saying before, Suppose I wanted to only make a small change to a fickle if it's in a release, but I don't need to recompile the code. There's an example for how you would do that. Uh, suppose I had a case where I want to run multiple executables in the same job. So I, I do, for example, I run a reconstruction and then I want to remote run the remission removing fickle immediately after. So the output of one step is the input to the next. We have an example of that. Uh, suppose you want to run the different components of your workflow as completely separate jobs. You can do that too. Suppose you wanted to have some kind of iterative submission where, okay, I submit uh, once with one parameter set. I do another submission where I have another parameter set. Like if I were trying to scan some phase space or something, you can do that too. Suppose you had a case where you wanted, you had a large input set that maybe that was changing in time. And you want to submit some amount of it and you want to keep track automatically of what's already been submitted and handle automated recovery for jobs that failed. Last example is uh, of that. Other nice features of POMS include that it will automatically resubmit failures for you and you can set up different rules for what you want it to do in that case. Um, so uh, I encourage you to try it out. Again, uh, the examples here should work. Uh, let me know if you don't. Uh, the main thing is then the first time you do it, uh, and I think every several days thereafter, uh, you may need to upload your proxy to the server. Easiest way to do that is on the interactive nodes, set up five futils, run this upload file command, and it will just do it for you. So again, I think, yeah, you, I think it defaults to 120 hours or something. You have to do that every kind of five days or so. But again, it's... While it's maybe a bit annoying, it only takes a few seconds. Yeah. So okay. Uh, why don't we just? So hmm? Ken, I was just gonna say maybe we should run a like one or one and a half hour POMS tutorial as a special for people who who really are interested in doing the more advanced stuff. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think that would be probably more helpful no than you know try to race through these examples and it's after you've already had three hours of other stuff, right? So. Yeah, they're looking kind of tired. Yeah. Or, okay. or even like an office hours thing, you bring your workflow and say, here's what I want to do. How would I do this in POMS? And we can kind of brainstorm. But yeah, um, 